Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have the great pleasure to welcome Professor Eric Santisto. Professor Santisto majored in chemical engineering at Universidade Nacional Experimental Simon Bolivar, where he also completed his master's. For his doctorate, also at chemical engineering, Professor Santisto went to the North Carolina State University. He currently works as assistant on the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineer at North Carolina State University. Uh, Professor uh, Santiso interests are focused on computer-based discovery of new materials and chemicals, molecular modeling of solids and structured fluids, and also crystallization. Professor Santiso has over 50 publications between international journals and conference papers, which to date have been cited more than 700 times. So once again, welcome Professor Santiso. Thank you for being here. Please feel free to start your talk. All right, let me try to get the PowerPoint working. Okay. All right, you can see my slide? Yep. All right, so um, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation uh, for the seminar. This is this is uh, a very prestigious uh, seminar series. I mean, I'll be, I was looking at the list of speakers and I was like, wow, why did they invite me? But <laughs> you know, thanks. Uh, so th today I will be talking about uh, modeling nucleation of molecular crystals. So this is work uh, that I've been doing actually for quite a while now, and we're developing it further now in, in the group. So you know, just to motivate it, um, crystallization actually is important in many applications. I'm a chemical engineer, so I'm usually focused on what this is going to be useful for, and. Um, you know, crystalline materials are present in a lot of industries, uh, be it the food industry, uh, the specialty chemicals, construction, uh, military, for example, uh, HDX and RDX, which are used to make plastic explosives, they have crystalline polymers and some of them are unstable. So, you know, if you're trying to manufacture this, it's something that you want to be able to control very well. And the same thing happens uh, actually with pharmaceuticals, and that's actually most of the, the funding and the background uh, of our work has been uh, inspired by the pharmaceutical industry. So there's many drugs uh, that have different crystalline forms, and those, when you take them into your body, are going to act in a different way. They have different bioavailability, solubility, and so on. And when you're making drugs, uh, you know, because of that and, you know, of course, because of regulations, you need to be able to control very well the, the solid form that comes out of your manufacturing process. So, you know, one of the things that determines uh, what crystal form you may get uh, is what happens at the initial stages of the crystallization, which is the nucleation process. And that's what we've been focusing on uh, for quite a while. Now, studying crystal nucleation is actually very difficult, and, and it's funny because we're, we're running a SICAM workshop also virtually um, this week, and, and you know, Baron Peters was there, and he was saying that nucleation is the rarest of rare events, right? Because if you compare it to a chemical reaction, you know, nucleation only has to happen once in your entire container, whereas reaction events are happening all the time everywhere. So it is an extremely rare event. So from the perspective of simulation, that makes it difficult to handle. Uh, now, of course, from ex the experimental perspective, it's also difficult to, to study. Uh, first, it's a stochastic process. So you don't really know where it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. And it usually involves only a few molecules. So you're looking for a tiny, tiny amount of molecules and you're, you don't know where or when it's going to happen. Even worse, it is greatly affected by, by tiny features in your system. So if you have a tiny impurity in any surface in your system, then that's going to completely change the nucleation rate because it's going to go and nucleate on the impurity. So that makes it hard to, to study. And even for simple systems like water, you know, here's, this is one of my favorite uh, plots. These are different papers who try to measure experimentally the nucleation rate of water. Okay, so it's not an exotic molecule, it's just water. And, and you know, you can see, especially in this range of temperatures, that if I ask you what is the what is the nucleation rate close to 240, you see the values range between something around, you know, 10 to the minus one and 10 to the six. So, you know, the error bar is, is six orders of magnitude, which, you know, it also makes it hard for us who are trying to model this, because if you make a prediction, I can easily make a prediction that, that falls into that error bar, uh, but that doesn't mean I'm right, right? So, so from the 
theory simulation perspective is also complicated because, you know, first things that are based on microscopic properties are going to break down because you're looking at only a few molecules doing something. It's a rare event. Even, you know, to start doing simulations, you have to start by fitting a force field because for most solids that we want to simulate, if you take any force fields uh, off the shelf and you try to measure solid state properties, they don't work. They give you the wrong structure, the wrong melting point. So you typically have to start by even feeding your own model uh, to, to be able to do the study. Uh, there, are, there are typical assumptions you do in molecular modeling that completely mess up your results. So just having periodic boundary conditions uh, can create huge artifacts in your results. And uh, you also have issues with solid depletion um, where you, you know, when you're, say, modeling nucleation from a solution, as your crystal is growing, the um, solution is being depleted from solid molecules. So you are, you, and, and because your simulation box is not very large, that means that you are substantially changing the concentration and that creates a free energy profile that is completely messed up. Okay, so, so there's a lot of challenges in modeling this. Now, from our perspective, uh, where a lot of the most recent work we've, we've been doing is, is centered is on crystallization of drug molecules. And I'm going to talk a bit about that um, in the second half of my talk. Uh, and, and of course, you know, this is, this is important for drug manufacturing. It's also important in, when you're in the st initial stages and you're trying to decide, let's say you have multiple drug candidates and you're trying to figure out which one you're going to produce. One of the things that drives that decision is which one of these is going to be easier to make, to, to turn into a pill, right? But if you, if you have a bunch of chemicals that just came out of, of you know, a search, a computer search, you know, these chemicals don't exist. And if you want to figure that out, you would need to synthesize them and do a lot of experiments on them. So having computational tools that allow you to answer those questions would be actually very useful at those stages because then you don't have to, to you can bypass that, that process. Um, there's a lot of uh, horror stories that you can hear uh, from, from people who work in this, in this industry about problems with crystallization. So one of the famous ones is ritonavir, which is an HIV drug that, you know, went through clinical trials with one form and then suddenly they, they discovered that they were making this needle form, form 2, which is a thermodynamically stable form. And, they, you know, they basically had to recall the drug. Uh, and it ended up costing a ton of money. So there are also, you know, molecules that are very slow to crystallize. So, you know, you can crystallize them, but you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, very practical. And these things obviously have, a, have consequences uh, for the final product. So, you know, there are several big challenges in this, and obviously we cannot solve all the problems, but I'm going to list three. Uh, one of them is, let's say that you have a molecule and you, you want to be able to predict what crystalline form that molecule is going to have. So this crystal structure prediction, that's a very difficult problem. Uh, and there's a lot of people who have been making a lot of progress in this area. I don't do that. So I'm going to assume that somebody has solved that problem already. What I want to deal with is the other two questions. So if I have this drug and I know it's going to crystallize in this form or forms, is it going to be easy or hard to crystallize it? under which conditions is it going to be easy to crystallize? So would I like to crystallize in water or in acetonitro? Um, and also, which polymorph am I going to get under different conditions and with different solvents, okay, if, it's, if it has polymorph? So we're going to be focusing on those last two questions. Uh, and that's, that's where we want to get with this. So the method we use uh, for to find this nucleation uh, pathways is the string method in collective variables. So this is a method uh, that was proposed like around close to 15 years ago. And, and the idea here is you're trying to find a minimum free energy path connecting two stable basins. So here, you know, this is an example that's showing a kind of very noisy Muller potential surface where you have some minimum here and some minimum here. And in our case, those would be the liquid basin and the solid basin. So we're looking for what is the trajectory of minimum free energy that connects those two basins? And you know, the assumption is that's going to be the highest probability pathway. And that's going to tell us information about, for example, what is the barrier for the nucleation process. So the way this works is you start with an initial discre discretized path between the two stable basins. And it doesn't even have to be a great path, but of, of course it helps. So in this case, these red dots are the initial pathway. 
And what you do is at every point, and, and obviously there's some X and Y coordinates here, which are order parameters that describe the process. I'm gonna talk a lot about this uh, in a second. But you have those points, and what you do is you use restrained molecular dynamics to estimate the gradient of the free energy at each one of those points. So for example, if I'm at this point, I, run, I, I add a harmonic restraint that keeps the order parameters close to those values. And from the average of that restraint force, I have the gradient of the free energy. So now that I have the gradient of the free energy, I know from each one of these images which way the free energy is going down. So I follow that direction by a small step. I get a new set of images. And now if I only did that and I keep going, what's going to happen is the images are going to collapse onto the minima and I'm going to learn nothing about the mechanism. So I need some way to keep them in the middle. So the way that it's done in, in the stream method is you interpolate a curve to the new set of images and you redistribute them along the new path. And you repeat this process until the whole thing converges. And that gives you an estimate of what is the minimum free energy pathway connecting the two, the two points. Okay, so this is taken from the website of Eric van der Ende, who is one of the people who developed the method. So you can also, by integrating the, by doing the line integral of the gradient of the free energy along the path, you can get the potential of mean force, which is kind of like a free energy, but it's a free energy in a high dimensional space. Right, because you typically have more than one uh, order parameter when you do this. You can, you can fix that and get actually a free energy along the reaction coordinate by doing a process that's called Voronoi milestoning. And I'm just showing this here, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later because I'm going to show you results uh, from this process. But even before we start, as I mentioned, you know, we have this plot here that has an X and Y axis, and we need to figure out what X and Y are. So what order parameters are we going to use uh, in order to measure where we are in this space of liquid slash solution versus solid. And it is, it is a bit problematic uh, if you're trying to do this for things like pharmaceuticals because you know, you, you're going to be doing it for different molecules. So you want to be able to tell, well, if, if now this drug company tells me I want to learn about this molecule, I need to be able to generate these other parameters for that molecule. And so it's not like the Nanayon's fluid where you can come up with things that are based on, on the symmetry of the, of the crystal. Once you have molecular crystals, that becomes more complicated. So the way we do it is, um, you know, we, we take advantage of the fact that, you know, when you have a regular crystal, if you are in a molecule in that crystal, you in principle more or less know where your neighbors are going to be in which direction and how they're going to be oriented relative to you. This, this is one thing that is a bit frustrating. I always like to show this picture because if I, if I show you this and I ask you which one of these is the crystal, it takes your brain less than a second to figure it out. Because you know, your brain has, evolved, has adapted to see symmetries very well. But you know, if, you, if I give you the X, one, X, Y, and C coordinates of the atoms and I ask you, is this a crystal? Unless those axes were oriented in a clever way, you would not be able to tell. Right, so that's what we want. We want functions that are sensitive to the structure. So we, we generate them by constructing a model to a generalized per distribution function, per correlation function, which contains information not only on distances, but also on the direction of the vector joining the centers of mass between the molecules. And also a relative orientation. So it's basically how do I have to orient this molecule to get this molecule? So we, we postulate, we posit a, an internal coordinate frame centered at each molecule. And the relative orientation is how do I have to rotate this coordinate frame to get this one? So that contains information not only in distance, but also in direction. And you can, in principle, also add internal flexibility. We, for most of the molecules we, we've been working with are rigid enough, uh, or this is relatively unimportant, so we, we don't do it. So most of the stuff I'm gonna be showing is using only the distance, uh, relative orientation, and, and the bond orientation, which means the orientation of the vector joining the centers of mass. So at zero temperature, we know exactly what this is. It is basically a superposition of delta functions. Right? If we know what the structure of the crystal, remember that problem is solved. I know what the crystal looks like. At zero Kelvin, I know every molecule is going to be exactly what it's supposed to be and with the orientation it's supposed to have, and everything is delta functions. So what we do is, we at finite temperature, we assume that this distribution spread and can be represented as a sum of products of contributions from the distribution of distances. Uh, this, this would be basically a model for the typical geopark. 
and also distributions of one orientations and relative orientations. And we postulate models for these functions. And in, in our case, these are the models that we use. So for the distance, uh, we use Gaussians, right? We assume that, you know, the peaks are going to just spread like Gaussians. For the bonds, orientations, and relative orientations, now we're talking about vectors and quaternions. So what we use to represent the relative orientation is a quaternion. So you cannot just use a Gaussian. We use distributions that are appropriate for those variables, which are the Fisher and the Watson distributions. And what we do then is we find the parameters that go into these distributions by running a molecular dynamic simulation of the crystal structure that is known. Okay, so now I take my crystal structure, I fit a force field, often I have to do it, I run an ND simulation, and now I use maximum likelihood estimation to find what these parameters are. And now I have a model for this per distribution function. And these functions are going to be sensitive to the structure of the crystal they were fitted for. So if I now have an, a structure that I don't know if it's a crystal or not, I can evaluate these functions for that structure, and it's going to tell me what's the probability locally that, the, that that local environment is crystalline or not. So we get those from molecular dynamics. And all these functions can be combined and matched in different ways to generate other parameters. So this is one. One example, you can just take the distance. This would be basically using the G of R as your as your function that you that you use to tell local crystalline structure. Usually, that doesn't work very well. You need to include the orientation information. Uh, you can do products of distance and bond orientation. We very often use this one. You can also do it with relative orientation, and you can have all of them. Um, obviously, you try to pick something that is good at separating the two the two states, uh, but it's also not too expensive to compute. And the problem with this is you end up with a lot of, of, of functions. Uh, you end up with a function for every molecule and for every peak in that per distribution function. So you need to reduce the number of variables. So we typically just sum over all the peaks. And we also do a spatial decomposition of the simulation box and then take local averages. So it basically average within each subcell. And that, that way I lose resolution, but I also reduce the number of collective variables. And you know you you see this this kind of funny uh, picture. I'm going to show you where this came from, but it's a critical nucleus of of benzene forming from a melt, and you know things are colored based on the on the color of their own cell. So that's why it looks a little bit like like pixelated because that's the level at, at which we we average our parameters. So this was one of the one of the first uh, systems we looked at uh, and you know what what I'm showing you here is benzene it's it's way under cool it's at 200 Kelvin and on the right hand side you have liquid benzene and on the left hand side you have crystalline benzene and this is the potential of mean force you get along the path uh, from the stream method so you see the liquid is higher than the solid because the solid is a stable phase the nucleation process would be what happens between this point and this point right so what I'm showing here is uh, a snapshot from one of the simulations that correspond to the points on the, on the right, that's a liquid. And the color coding I'm going to use is red for things that uh, have a local environment that is liquid-like, and they're going to be blue if it's solid-like. Okay, on the liquid side, everything's red. And as you start moving up, you start seeing this gray region that appears here. This is not a real corner because this has periodic boundary conditions. So it's really a, a small nucleus that is appearing. And as you get up to the top, what would be the critical nucleus, this is, this is what you have. So you have this region that looks fairly crystalline, surrounded by a more diffusely crystalline layer, and then the liquid phase. Then. <clears throat> As you continue, the, uh, what I'm going to show you now is unfortunately not great because, and this is one of the problems with, with the periodic boundary conditions, no matter how large your simulation box is, you are always going to end up with the nuclei growing against their own periodic images. So you're always going to have to jump from a regime where you have a solid growing in a liquid matrix to a liquid shrinking in a solid matrix. And the fact that you do that makes that unphysical. So the growth part of the, of the process is artificial, uh, but I have to have it there because I need to have the other end of the process when I run the stream method. So I need to have the solid also the other side. You just have to do this for simulation boxes of different sizes and make sure that any artifacts that appear, appear after the critical nucleus, which is the part that you're interested in. Okay. 
So this actually is a potential of mean force, and one thing that that you know people um, often often raise with this is you have a lot of order parameters here. So when you do this restraint dynamics, you're removing quite a bit of entropy from the system because you're restraining a lot of degrees of freedom. That can be resolved by this process I, I mentioned that's called Voronoi maltstoning. And the idea here is you take these images that came out of the stream method calculation and you use them to de define a Voronoi tessellation of the order parameter space. So Voronoi tessellation essentially is uh, if you know a point belongs to this Voronoi cell, if it is closer to this point than to any of the other points, right? So that defines a partition of the order parameter space. And now you can use the boundaries between these cells as milestones. So you run simulations where you keep the, the system within the Voronoi cell. So it's not just at a point, but you actually let it sample in the directions normal to the path. And you keep track of, of how often the system hits each one of the milestones. So that gives you a set of transition probabilities. And then you know you can use your typical Markov state theory to find what the free energy is. I mean, you, you find what the probabilities are from a from a master equation, and then you get the free energy as minus kt log of the probability. You can also st estimate rates from this uh, by keeping track of the times it takes between collisions with each one of the milestones. So we've done that, and now you know this is the example of benzene because it's it's the one that I can show you on a two-dimensional plot. So what we've done here is we've taken uh, the principal comp we've done a principal component analysis. Uh, to find what are the, the important directions that change uh, along the string once you have the converged string. And you find that m about 96, 97% of the variance along that path is contained in the first two vectors, which allows you to project what you're doing into a two-dimensional two dimensional uh, surface. So that's really nice. So what you see here is the Voronoi tessellation projected onto that two-dimensional surface. And you see I have a lot more images on this part. That's because that's the nucleation part. It's the one I care about. I don't really care much about what happens in this unphysical region where I'm just uh, turning everything into a bulk solid. So this is a projection of the trajectories generated from this Voronoi maltstoning process. And you see that the system is actually sampling in the directions orthogonal to the transition tube. And you actually get you know, the whole tube of high probability uh, for the for the transition, and you also get the 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 free energies. One thing that is a bit of a nightmare with this process is if you have regions of high curvature, sampling becomes difficult because you end up with a lot of events where uh, you have transitions between non-adjacent Voronoi cells. So that's one one drawback, and you know you need to be smart about where you place your your milestones to to alleviate that. But um, <clears throat> And then, you know, this is what happens in the case of benzene. You get a free energy, so that's a red curve on the left scale. And you see that the shape is very similar. It's just the values are now smaller because you are now just looking at one degree of freedom that you're restraining. And you also get a mean free passage time. So this point here is the characteristic time for the nucleation process. And you see that it's, oh, it's a microscopic quantity. We're talking about, say, 17,500 seconds. So, so it is something that is an extremely relevant that you know would be very, very difficult to look at otherwise. And you know, this is the computed rate. Uh, we, you know, need some way to validate this experimentally. But you know, the the, the point that I tried to make uh, before is, you know, typically the error bars on these numbers are huge, so it's hard to it's hard to you know come up with a very good way to validate it. We've done uh, a lot of, you know, benzene is a nice molecule to work with because it's simple. So we've done a lot of studies. You know, one thing that we that we found, and this was an earlier paper where we did this with transition path sampling, is that if you look at uh, at critical nuclei, once you have things that have, uh, you know, orientational degrees of freedom, then just how many molecules you have in the cluster is not good enough. It is also how well are orient them oriented with respect to each other. Um, that makes it likely or not likely to, to grow to a crystal. And you can also look at the principal components that come out of this principal component analysis that I mentioned uh, before and try to use them to learn something about the nucleation mechanism. So the one that contains the largest variation is, all, is basically like a symmetric combination of all the other parameters. So that one is just telling you your system is going from less order to more order, which we already knew. The second one has a little bit more detail. Uh, and if you were to look at the gradient of that principal component um, at the top of the barrier, 
you you see that the 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 coordinates that are causing the largest change in that variable are in this in this kind of fun, funky L-shaped group of benzene molecules. And funny enough, when we earlier did this with transition path sampling and used likelihood maximum ma maximum likelihood estimation to come up with a reaction coordinate, we also found a very similar result to this. So it's, there's this motif that is is kind of uh, where things are changing the most uh, along the nucleation pathway. So we've done this for a number of other systems. Benzene is the one where I have a lot of stuff because we've tried a lot of different methods at it because it's simple. But we've done this for um, ionic liquid. So this is an example where the ionic liquid will become no longer an ionic liquid. It will become an ionic solid. So we're looking at the crystallization of the methylimidazolium chloride. And we were able to also, um, to also generate uh, free energies. This thing here actually was one where we had a big headache due to the periodic boundary conditions. And, and I can tell you a story about this later if you want, but one thing that we found is that you can very easily be fooled uh, into believing that you found a critical nucleus that is not a real critical nucleus. If you, if, and so you need to really be careful about making your system larger and, and making sure that you overcome these this, uh, finite size artifacts. We have also done heterogeneous nucleation, uh, and you know, of course, this adds an additional uh, big complication, which is you know, you need to have a surface, and what surface is that, and how do you pick it? Even if you if you say I'm going to pick a crystalline surface, which phase are you going to look at? Uh, and defects are going to be important. So here, this was more of a of a proof of concept. So what we did is let's put a graphene disk. Uh, inside this, this dimethylimidazolium chloride solution and then look at the crystallization in the vicinity of that particle. And this was inspired by, by work that uh, Valeria Molinero has done with uh, ice nucleation on impurity. So it's basically you take this graphene disk and, and pretend that it's a, it's a model for a soot particle. And, you know, we were able to see the effect that the surface has on the on the nucleation process so you see that there's this uh, ordering of the solute that happens because of the presence of this graph in this and that actually causes the nucleation to happen uh, close to the disk but away from it and it results of course in a lower nucleation barrier but now um, these are all examples of melt nucleation but the more technologically relevant um, thing that we would like to look at is nucleation from solution Right, because that's typically how you make, for example, drugs. You need to crystallize them from a solution. So here I'm talking about some more recent work uh, where we were trying to look at drug molecules. These are two, two uh, anti, antimicrobial drugs, sulfomeracin and sulfadiacin. So they are used, uh, they're all drugs. Uh, they're not super commonly used now, but they are used, they, they are some of the things that, they can, can, that can be treated with them are bronchitis and toxoplasmosis and some STDs. And um, I like this system because it's, it's, it shows how very small features in your, in your molecule can have a large impact on the crystallization process. Okay, so these two are almost the same molecule, except this one has a methyl group here instead of a hydrogen. And they have, this one has three polymers, this one has only one, and it doesn't look like any of these three. The solubility is about a third. And you know that 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 is a consequence of the fact that you know in the crystal the molecules are packed very closely together, and you know any small change in the molecule can cause a large change in the equilibrium crystal structure. It also it also you know is it's also related to the fact that you know normal force fields uh, are often not parameterized for molecules that are packed as closely together as they are in a solid, and that's why you often get wrong results if you try to do crystallization with a class with a force field that has been fitted. To liquid or solution properties. So this is this is uh, the one that I want to talk about now, which is sulfomeracin, and we looked at two different polymers. There's a third one, but it's very uncommon. So we looked at the ones that are commonly found in crystallization experiments. And uh, this form on the bottom, form two, is the one that is stable at room temperature. Uh, form one is becomes stable at higher temperature. And you know some questions that we had is. Uh, you know, there's this this Oswald rule of stages, which which says um, that you know usually when you do a crystallization, the least stable polymorph appears first. So we wanted to see if that happens in this case. In other words, 
can we make a prediction about which polymorph is going to appear when we crystallize these molecules if we don't know it beforehand? And also, which one has the lowest nucleation barrier? And again, you know, you would, you would anticipate that the one with the lowest nucleation barrier is actually the one that crystallizes first. So we went through the process of fitting the order parameters. So this is, this is a paper that came out recently in crystal growth and design. So we first did this fitting and we fitted order parameters sensitive to the structures of form one and form two. And all this picture is doing is showing you that if you take a melt or a solution and the crystal, the parameters have uh, different values. So they are working to do their job, which is differentiating between the structures. Now this is a log scale. So they are actually, they actually have quite different values. Um, and then we did the stream method simulations for form one and form two in three different solvents. So we did it in methanol, water, and acetonitrile, which are common solvents uh, that are used for crystallization of, of these molecules. And in all cases, we found this potential of mean force. Uh, so this is just one, one representative example. And you can see, you know, that you start from a solution and you end up with a crystal inside of a solution. I'm only showing you the solute here because if I show the solvent, you don't see anything. And we use this to estimate the nucleation barrier for, for all these different molecules. So this is a summary of the results. So on the top, you have the nucleation um, curves for form one, and in the bottom, you have them for form two. And in all cases, you see that the nucleation barrier is lower for form one that form that than for form two. So the values on the on the top row always I don't know what I did. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Somehow I managed to make my my lock my screen. So the values on the top row are always smaller than the values on the bottom row. So so that tells you that you would expect to see form one in all these cases. And uh, my student who was working on this project actually went to, to Groton to work with Pfizer. And they, were run, they ran several experiments to study the nucleation of these molecules. One thing they did was they actually found that you do indeed get form one when you crystallize this in, in methanol acetonitrile and water. So at least the, what we're predicting is consistent with what you see experimentally. Now, one thing that I mentioned earlier was depletion, right? The issue of solute depletion uh, and, and how it may affect the simulation. So, so when you're running a constant number of molecules, as you're making your crystal, you're changing the concentration of the solution, that introduces an artificial gradient of chemical potential that can result in completely wrong uh, free energy profiles. So this is, this is a picture for a, from a paper from Matteo Salvalaglio where he, you, you have here the, the, um, the supersaturation and the system size. And you see that depending on how supersaturated your system is, or uh, you cannot even see a barrier for nucleation, because that additional gradient of chemical potential you're creating artificially completely, you know, erases the barrier. So it's important to know wh where in this chart you are. Uh, if you are in this region, that's actually a good thing because at least the nucleation part of the process is correct. But if not, you're going to have to figure out how to fix it. So one, one way that we did this, and this is also in this small fist paper, uh, is we, we figured out a way to run the string method in a different ensemble. And, and the key to, to this is to realize that the gradient of the free energy can be calculated in any ensemble and used in a different ensemble. Uh, so let's say that you have a vector of collective variables and you're, you, you're looking at the free energy as a function of those collective variables and the usual thermodynamic variables. If you were to do a Legendre transform with respect to any of the thermodynamic variables, you're still going to keep this term. It's the same thing that happens with the chemical potential, right? So if I, for example, go to the osmotic ensemble where I keep constant the chemical potential of one component and the number of molecules of the other, then I can still use the same gradient that I compute, say, in the NPT ensemble to evolve the string. Which is great because what, what makes things difficult here is that you know when you're doing the molecular dynamic simulation, it's hard to do it without a constant number of molecules. So you can do your molecular dynamics, a constant number of molecules, and when you update the string, you update the number of molecules to be consistent with the ensemble that you want. But you can still reuse the same gradient you calculated from the restraining team. So that's great because you know it eliminates the it eliminates the problem of of um, of having to do molecular dynamics at variable number of molecules. We typically uh, vary the number of solvent molecules, and that's because it's usually much easier to insert solvent than insert solutes. I mean, the solutes are typically larger molecules, and and it makes it more complicated. 
So we did this for, for the molecules that I showed you. And you know, in this case, we're lucky enough that we don't really see a change in the nucleation barrier. We actually see changes, but they happen after the barrier. And you know, the, the more insoluble your molecule is, the more likely you are to be in this regime. The, the, the drawback is that you're also more likely to be at a, at a ridiculously high supersaturation that is not realistic. Um, but it, at least in this case, the effect of depletion we managed to show it's not, it's not uh, affecting our results that much. We also did this for both for sulfadiacin and sulfamericin. So we tried to estimate uh, how the nucleation barrier change in different solvents. The sulfadiacin case, actually, we're redoing some of these calculations because it's one example where we see what I just mentioned, that the barrier is ridiculously low, and that's because this molecule is ridiculously insoluble, so you need a ton of solvent in order to fix that problem. But we got results similar to this uh, for sulfamericin, and they're both consistent. So if we if we rank the nucleation barriers predicted by the method and use it to, to say, um, you know, in, in which solvent is it going to be easier to crystallize, you would conclude in this case it's easiest in acetonitrile and it's hardest in methanol. And, um, you know, my student also did some nucleation induction time experiments, and he found that indeed uh, the nucleation barrier from simulations correlates uh, in the right way with the nucleation rates. So, so in principle, if we had if we had made the prediction, you should crystallize this in acetonitrile because it's going to be easier. Um, then you know you would you would find this result consistent in the experiment. Now we're moving we're moving in a in a in a different direction. So I'm going to just uh, in a couple of slides tell you about what we're doing now related to what happens to the solvent. So often when people look at these problems they define collective variables that are based on the solute, right? So you think of how many molecules do I have in my solid cluster? How are these molecules in this solid cluster oriented with respect to each other? But you typically don't explicitly account for what the sol what's happening to the solvent around this, this solid. And what we found is that you can actually uh, fit these order parameters that I described earlier also to be sensitive to the local structure of a liquid. So you can actually take a bulk liquid, do this fitting of these functions that I mentioned earlier for the solid. It's a bit more complicated, but it can be done. And now you have functions that are sensitive to the local structure of the solvent. And now if you put something else in that solvent, you can tell what is that thing doing to the solvent. So this is a tripeptide, actually. And you have a felinaline residue here. And what you have around it is water. And this red color is indicating how the structure of the water is being disrupted by the presence of that hydrophobic residue. So you can actually use these variables to measure that. And then the question is, can we use that to learn something more about the nucleation process? Here's one case that we're now looking at, which is, um, this is uh, from earlier work that was done by the group of Michele Parinello, where they were looking at nucleation of urea in different solvents. And one thing they find is that urea follows a classical one-step mechanism for crystallization in methanol. But in acetonitrile, it doesn't do that. It first forms clumps, and then those clumps crystallize and, and form a crystal. So it follows a two-step process. And we run simulations where now we're looking at solvent molecules here. And the solvent molecules are the stick representations, not the volume stick. And they are colored based on uh, this liquid uh, order parameter. So if they are blue, that means that their local structure is not very different from that of the pure solvent. So if you look at what happens to methanol when you put urea in it, it's not that terrible. So a lot of the molecules are blue. So it's, it's not really disrupting the local structure of the solvent as much. But acetonitrile is being disrupt, dis, disrupted, and that creates a driving force for aggregation, which results in this two-step mechanism. So you see that we can learn something about what's happening by looking at the structure of the solvent is doing. And one thing we're trying to do now is incorporate this in the description of the stream method and see you know, how the results we obtain change. The last thing I, I'm going to show you here, this is one, one example where we did this sulfadiacin that I just showed you earlier in two different solvents where we see different results. And on the left side, you have the potential of mean force. Now, on the right, you have the norm of the the gradient of the order parameter vector at that point in the past. So you're seeing how much the order parameters are changing at that point in the past. But these are now the solvent order parameters, not the solute. And you see that there's actually a quanti quantitative, qualitatively different behavior in acetonitrile and in methanol. So if you, if you look at the right-hand side, 
you know, the, the change is more or less monotonic in the vicinity of the nucleation event. But if you look at the left, you can see that there's actually a maximum along the pathway. Okay, so that's telling you that there's something that's happening to the solvent. It's rearranging in some in some particular way at that stage in the process. And, and again, incorporating these variables in the description may be important to, to uh, you know, get a good picture of what the mechanism for the process is. So I, I think I've been talking for 40 minutes, so this is my summary slide. But basically, we've, you know, we've been able to combine these structure-based sort of parameters with the string method um, and use them to study nucleation of molecular crystals, both from the melt and from solution. And we've been able to do it for reasonably realistic models of drug molecules. So it's, it's not just Lena Jones fluid or anything like that. And we are also able to quantify the effect of depletion uh, using this osmotic ensemble method, which is which is I feel something something nice. Uh, we're now, you know, again the sulfur diacin, we're we're doing this with lower supersaturations, but you know, one thing we're doing now is implementing these explicit solvent order parameters into our software, uh, so we can we can use that. So just uh, so final acknowledgement, um, you know, these are my collaborators. So two from Pfizer who were working on on their side. Uh, Manas, who is now at Aspen Tech, he did the, the work a while ago, transition pet sampling. The work on, on um, ionic liquids was done with the work with the work of Francisca Hung, and uh, these are the people who did the calculations at NC State. And uh, that's it. I, I have a group picture, but this is a really old group picture because we haven't been able to meet recently. But anyway, the two people I mentioned who did the work are at the end points of this picture. So this is Chen Zhang and this is Nathan. So those are the ones who did the majority of the calculation. And uh, that's what I have. So you know, I'm, I'm happy to stop here and take any questions you, you might have. So. Thank you Thank so you, much, Ed. Professor Santiso. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now open for questions. Uh, if you ask one, if you want to ask one, please enable your microphone, or you can write it on the chat. And of course, our YouTube viewers can also write questions on the YouTube chat. And I'm Larissa, and I'll be handling the questions from now on. So I, I have a question, if that's OK. Of um, so very, very fascinating talk. Uh, really, really okay. great work all around. Um, can you just comment briefly, uh, what kind of sensitivity does the results of the string method have to the choice of order parameters? So if you were to go back and do the calculations with a different order parameter, how much do the results change? So that test, we really only did it once with benzene. So, you know, I'm, I'm showing one data point, right? I mean, in, they didn't change that much. However, you know, that's not a guarantee of anything because, you know, as you, your, simple, your system becomes more complicated, it may be that there's something important that you're missing. And that's part of the reason why we want to do this solvent structure thing. Because you know we feel like not including explicitly any of the solvent degrees of freedom in the reaction coordinate may lead to an error, um, but you know that's what we know. Unfortunately, these calculations are expensive enough that we cannot just really do a lot of them for fun. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah, and I was thinking, you know, in hydrate nucleation, you see sometimes the order parameters include both the water and the guest molecules as mm -hmm. well. So there, in that sense, you mm -hmm. have that. So yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, we have another question from Maria Rosa. Uh, she wants to know if the paraffins in the solid phase are amorphous solid or they have a crystalline structure. So in, in all our cases, we're trying to nucleate crystals, right? So we, we, don't really, we don't really get anything amorphous. I mean, you do, in these examples I showed where you see this two-step process, you do see the formations, the formation of an amorphous clump as an intermediate stage to get into the crystal. But what we're always trying to look at is, uh, is the barriers for nucleation of the crystalline solid. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone have another question? I can, uh, I'm going to ask you one, please. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Eric. Very nice talk. Uh, if I understood, uh, you fixed the, uh, the crystal structure on the liquid phase, is it? Yeah, so, so I, I fixed my endpoint. So I have the final bulk solid and the bulk liquid. Also. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and try to, to define uh, the, your path, your best path. Mm 
Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, on, uh, uh, in, you see uh, a trouble with uh, bothering conditions uh, when you have uh, a pure crystal structure. Mm -hmm. But if you are in a liquid phase, like in a solvent, mm -hmm. uh, do you see the same problem? Well, in the, the bothering conditions? If you have a solution, the nature of the of the finite size of XUC is different. So, in the case of a solution, you have the advantage that you can put the solvent around the, the solid, and then you no longer have to switch to that regime where you have the liquid shrinking in the solid. However, you have to deal with solute depletion, which is a problem you don't have if you're nucleating from a melt. So you still have a, a, a major a problem due to the finite size, but it's a different sort of problem. And yeah, I mean, I, 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 I saw, uh, you know, I can show you if you want what happens in the case of the, of the melt, which is, you know, this is something that I was breaking my head for a long time trying to figure out. Um, so this is, you know, what we were getting for this dimethylimidazolium chloride, right? And this is a free energy mm -hmm. passage, first passage time. And we were getting this and, you know, it looks like there's a secondary, like a shoulder here and then a maximum here. And yeah. Well, I'm trying to figure out if the shoulder meant anything, right? And, you know, this is my slide that I call periodic boundary conditions are evil. So um, what was happening here is that, you know, you always have to jump from this regime. This is the blue line where you have the solid growing in the liquid matrix, to yeah. the red, which is the red line, which is the liquid shrinking in the solid matrix, right? So now the liquid here is not the stable phase. So the more liquid you make, you, you, you know, it keeps increasing, but you because the end point of the string is the bulk solid, you have to actually jump from this curve to this curve. And where you do that jump matters a lot because you may end up seeing that jump as a maximum. So, you know, like after thinking a lot about this, we figured out that what was happening was that this thing here was actually the jump from one curve to the other. So you would be fooled in thinking that this is the critical nucleus when in reality it was actually here. In the shoulder, and we mm. found out by running a simulation with a bigger system. So, I so don't... it's really dangerous because you you may have you know we could have published a paper like this and say look this is the critical nucleus we're done right and it would be completely wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was wondering. That is my second question. Okay, nice. <laughs> this <is> so better. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how? Well, we, we, you define a temperature for your study, okay, for your dynamic study. Mm -hmm. How, uh, and we know uh, uh, that close to the uh, melt temperature, we have a, a, a liquid film that may form mm -hmm. uh, doing to the uh, interface problem. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with this? Well, I mean, like, how close to the melting point can you go? Uh... Well, th there. So there's two things there. So one is we cannot go very close because as you approach a melting point, the size of the critical nucleus diverges. So yeah. because we have these large finite side effects, finite size effects, we always have to work at very high supersaturations uh, because otherwise the, the the simulation will have to be so large that you just cannot do it. And and the same thing happens in solution, by the way. Uh, this is this is this is one problem. Now about the 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 nature of the layer around the solid, we actually do see a diffuse layer around the crystal all the time. I mean, we, we see it in all the simulations, and 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 you know I, that you can see that in the picture of the critical nucleus for benzene that I was showing at the beginning, uh, where you have you know you have the crystalline nucleus, and then you have this um, this kind of only partially ordered layer around it. Let's see if I can share that screen. You, you, okay. So here. Yeah. So you see that it, it's not really a sharp transition between one thing and the other. You actually have a kind of sort of not quite liquid, not quite crystalline layer around it. So it's it's a it's a bit more diffuse. Than even the, for a long simulation, is it? Yeah, yeah, even at high supersaturations, you still see it around the crystal. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Okay. You, yeah. Uh, well, I think you have some um, measurement for these layers experimentally. 
uh, I, I'm not sure if you have for a lot of system, but for water, they are measuring these uh, liquid-like layer uh, close to the solid phase. Uh, uh, can maybe can can you use this as a, a, a information uh, showing that you are close to the physical stuff? Or? I don't know, but I'm making a note to look for it. <laughs> so okay. Um, Yeah, we haven't we haven't done a lot with ice uh, with liquid, but water, but we, it can be done. Um, uh, we haven't done it just because you know I try to I try to stay away from from problems that a lot of smart people are already looking at. So, <laughs> <laughs> and water is an example of that. Yes, it's yeah. true. <laughs> but, but yeah, thank I mean, it can, it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a question on the chat by Marcellus Guedes. Uh, do you want to ask or do you want me to read it? I, I, I can see it. Uh, the, okay. answer, the answer to that, so it's kind of phenomenal for linking out the observe uh, and could, you, could this be related to the solvent effect you mentioned? That is an excellent question and we are actually starting to, one of the things we're starting to do now is, is looking at what happens when you have two liquid phases. Okay, and, and whether you know the presence of a second liquid phase can also affect the nucleation rate. So this is one problem that we're interested in looking at. We haven't looked at it, uh, but it is one of the one of the things that this is branching into is trying to look at what happens in that case. So so yeah, it's a very very good point. Um, so there's a question. Yeah, uh, by Professor Richards. Yeah. Do you wanna oh. ask? Slide 55, let me try to get there. Uh, going down, going down. Okay, uh, let me... Uh, you're talking about the, the figure from, from Mateo's paper, this one. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So, you're right. I mean, this is actually the regime you want to be in, uh, but it's actually a bad regime to be in from the practical point of view. So this is what happens when you have a very sparingly soluble solid. Uh, and in that, in that case, you reach the critical nucleus so fast that you know it happens before you've managed to create this artificial gradient of free energy uh, large enough to blanch, to blanch out you know, the rest of the curve. But the problem is that because you have a very sparingly soluble solute, that means that if you want to make any reasonably realistic simulation, you need to put a ton of solvent. <laughs> in your simulation box. Hmm. Yeah. And that makes it really, really hard to do the simulation, right? So if you're, on the other hand, modeling systems that, you know, people usually like to model, like urea and glycine, that are more soluble, they are nicer for simulations because you don't need as much solvent, but then you're very likely to be in this regime where you don't even see a barrier. And, and you know, one, at one point we were trying to look at glycine and you see this. Right, and we were thinking, okay, what are we doing wrong? There is no barrier for nucleation. There should be a barrier for nucleation, right? And and you know, later I found this, and and then it's obvious that this is a depletion effect. So, we haven't tried to do the osmotic uh, simulations for for that glycine system, but it's one thing that I would like to do. It's just I, you know, I cannot have finite manpower. I have to go where the money drives me. But <laughs> but that that's also an important thing. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's the answer to the second question then that. So you you weren't here for the previous two seminars, but uh, uh, so I, I that that's expected. You might not understand this question, but uh, maybe you've seen Carol Carol Hall's presentations yeah. before, mm -hmm. where she shows how these chains kind of aggregate, right? And they form what looks to me like a kind of a crystal nucleus, and and that's occurring over, uh, you know this the length of her simulation and and uh, very similar to me uh, not being no uh, it, is Eric Mueller's simulation the basketball team mm -hmm. they kind of did the same thing over what seemed like a short amount of time it is possible that it's just that the driving force is very large so you know if you look at the the results I was showing for sulfadiazine you know this was kind of a little bit self bashing because uh, but I wanted to to point out this issue of the of the of the solubility 
um, if, if I had shown you the sulfamericin results, it would not be so obvious. But if you look at this, the nucleation barrier you see here in acetonitrile and water is something that you could overcome in a regular ND simulation, right? So if you are in a, in a regime where, you know, your driving force is huge, you may be able to see it, you know, it's no longer a rare event. And that's actually why I put quotation marks around this barrier, you know, because it's not a real rare event once you get to that point. And, and that's, you know, part of the reason why we haven't published this. I'm redoing it with more solvent because I, I don't want a reviewer to mock me, right? But, uh, <laughs> you know, this is, this is, it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, it's possible. I, I don't really, I don't really know it's, if it's happening in their case, but it's, you know, my assumption would be that the driving force probably is large enough to see it in their simulation. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I see a question. Uh, so thank you very much for this very nice talk. Thank you. Um, do you also go in the other direction? So the, the method is very nice with the Voronoi tessellation. So do you also do melting with it? Can you do that? It seems it might, might be even easier, right, than crystallization. Uh, well, I mean, if you were trying to look at melting in, you know, as the reverse of our process, which is basically forming a cavity of liquid that grows into a solid, we're already seeing that because we're, what we're generating is a reversible path, right? Mm -hmm. now, now, most likely what happens in reality is not that, all right? So, so it's, you know, you would have to, you would have to modify your system to, to have a, some surface or something. Mm -hmm. uh, most likely the melting is gonna happen on that surface. So the method itself is agnostic as to what pro what activated process you're trying to model. You can use it for 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 anything, uh, mm -hmm. and we could use in principle the same order parameters to look at something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's it's more a matter of trying to come up with a physically realistic uh, picture of what what is going to happen during that melting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another question in the chat. Yes, Guilherme Silva. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, hi. Uh, as usual, it's a, some noise here, but I can try to, to ask. Uh, uh, so thank you for the presentation. It was very nice. Uh, and uh, I was recently uh, trying to perform some metadynamic simulations mm -hmm. uh, in alkane melts in order to see the crystallization. And I tried to use uh, this collective variable that was defined in the work of Urea that you mentioned, I think, mm -hmm. uh, involving this Gaussian kernel functions, mm -hmm. accounting for the orientation of vectors. Uh, I don't know if... Yeah, I, yeah I, have seen, I have seen... Actually, you know, we even have... I even contacted Mateo. You know, Mateo, I, I've known him for a while. and. Um, he sent us actually the results from his metadynamic simulations of, of urea nucleation. And we are actually trying to do two things with them. One is when using this liquid order parameters to interpret what he was seeing in those simulations, which is where that picture I showed you came from. But also we're trying to see if we can do the same thing and see if we're getting the same mechanism and the same barriers. We don't know that yet, but it's something that I wanted to do because, you know, it would be really cool if we could compare the results from different methods and see if they are the same. My, my hunch is that they're not going to be the same, but if they are, <laughs> it's a very happy, <laughs> a very happy experiment. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, but, uh, but uh, moreover, uh, in this in, in the simulation that I used this collective variable, I saw some problems that may be related with this uh, vicinity with the melting point that you mentioned. So this is a very good point that I didn't Get it, get it would know before this presentation so but uh i saw s some kind of abrupt change in the free energy profile i don't know if there is another uh structured phase that emerged hmm. and so i would like to ask if uh if the combination of this uh, collective variable involving this kind of functions with steinhardt parameters uh between the mass centers of the molecules could be as good or as an approximate way uh, as your fitted or the parameters uh that's it's hard to tell without trying it but you know 
like urea, you know, standard parameters work really well for what they were designed for, which is spherical objects that crystallize in things like FCC and, and HCP and so on, right? I don't know in this case if you're gonna be able to, to get something great uh, because the crystal structure is not gonna look like any of those things, right? And you know, I, I have I haven't thought about it. I, I cannot tell you whether it would work or not, but you know, my hunch is that it may not. Uh, we we've tried actually one of the things that we were looking into at the beginning, of course, is you know there was the Steinhardt parameters is the classic, you know, order parameters for nucleation, right? And we were trying to see if we could define something similar to that, but for molecular crystals, and we gave up. Uh, we found some papers in the literature where people try to define. I mean, the, the, the idea of this is, you know, you come up with with functions that, you know, when you add them, they, they kind of interfere constructively if you have a crystal and destructively if you don't, right? But once your molecule has an internal structure, the, what you need to do to construct those functions is, is horrible. So I, I found a paper where, you know, they had something like that just for CO2 and the functions are like the entire page of the paper. And, and you know, if you if you imagine trying to do something like that for even urea, I, I you know I would worry that it's too horrible. And that's why we, we kind of gave up on that and said, okay, let's assume we know the structure and construct things that use the structure as a cast, and then compare what we don't know to see if they fit in the cast. Um, so I cannot tell you that it will work because I don't know, but uh, my hunch is that it's going to be hard to make it work. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, regarding these maps, uh, I have fear just for looking for that green book about um, what, what, what is the, the name of the book about from Gubbins that has some of these other parameters that, yeah. that gave me some creeps. No. <laughs> uh, do we have another question? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, so, uh, since our time is almost over, I want to thank everyone for the discussion. And once again, thank you, Professor Santizo, for the presentation. Mm -hmm.